and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lockwood. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, underlying inflation in the U.S. has eased for a fourth month, keeping the Fed on track to lower interest rates next month. We're now joined by Bloomberg's Justina Lee and our executive editor for Asian markets, Paul Dobson. Uh, thank you both for joining us. Justina, I mean, it's a pretty exciting day because we had CPI and then we're getting a whole lot of more data out of the U.S. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, if we look at yesterday's CPI numbers, I mean, it kind of was, was you know, right there on ex- expectations. Headline inflation dropped below 3%. So we're kind of looking at, you know, expectations for what the Fed is going to do in, Dece- in September. It seems pretty solid that we're going to get that 25 basis point cut. For those of us who are kind of wondering if we're going to get 50 basis points, I'm not sure that CPI number supported that case necessarily. I mean, we still are kind of waiting for more progress on the services front and particularly on the shelter front when we think about, you know, like, you know, rents and kind of like, um, you know, owner equivalent numbers. It kind of seems like that is still looking pretty sticky. Yeah. But what's your take on all of this? When you look at, again, the market volatility that we saw last week, I guess the silver Silver lining is that we're maybe back to how bonds are, are meant to perform. And then we also look at Jackson Hole next week to have an indication of, I guess, the, the risk that central banks are willing to take. Yeah, it feels like a Jackson Hole, though. It's going to be a lot of uh, handshakes and slapping of the backs and uh, toasting with the champagne at the moment, Francine, because, you know, the market is thinking again that we can get this soft landing that everybody had been hoping for, where inflation comes down in a kind of controlled manner without uh, the economy uh, finding itself in a tailspin. Uh, That seems to be the message that we're getting from the central bankers around the world. We heard it from New Zealand today. You know, we see it as Justina was describing in the U.S. data, also the U.K. data as well. And markets are obviously responding to this um, in a pretty, in a pretty um, uh, relieved manner, given the volatility that we had, the little flare up uh, last week with uh, lower bond yields, uh, these uh, five days of gains in the equities market and relatively placid uh, e- uh, currency markets as well. The volatility starting to come down. Not everybody is convinced. Uh, we're still hearing lots of people have uh, retreated to the sidelines or in a little bit scarred by the volatility last week. But on the whole, it feels like right at this moment in time, everything is a little bit more relaxed and people getting back into that kind of groove that they were in uh, for most of the, the earlier part of the summer. Yeah, and just seeing we had a number of Fed speakers, Raphael Bostic, probably the most interesting because he really zoomed in on some of the things that he sees. But is, you know, is the data supporting the view that there is a gradual cooling of the U.S. economy, but not a, a screeching halt? I think so. And it was really interesting that Goolsby kind of noted, you know, the change in the unemployment rate, right? Because I think there was a lot of debate after that number came out, whether that might not be driven by weakening demand, but rather kind of an increase in labor supply. I mean, in that case, maybe it's not so worrying after all. But I think Goolsby kind of noted that while that could be a factor, he's increasingly concerned about the uptick in unemployment rate. And you can really see here, and also the comments from, you know, another Fed official, Bostic, that like the concern is slowly going from inflation to like is the labor market slowing too quickly um paul what do you see when you look at the soft landing trades which i I know we talked about quite a lot again there's a number of earnings that we need to watch out for walmart won't give us really an indication on employment but it will give us indication of consumer spending in the u.s Yeah, and that's going to be important. One of those things to watch out for, you know, how is the consumer holding up against this backdrop when we've been through this long period of uh, sustained uh, inflation? It feels like you know, there, there's been quite a lot of narratives about the idea that the consumer is weakening. Uh, the, 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 the savings that they had uh, for as a result of the pandemic are finally running out, that they're taking on more debt, that they're, you know, defaulting on things like car loans a little bit more frequently. But it doesn't seem to be anything that's particularly alarming. It's not showing up so much in the data. Uh, it's not showing up so much in the, in the measures of market risks either. I think as Justina was saying, you know, the Fed is starting to pay more attention to the uh, jobs market. That's what they told us they would do. Powell said it earlier on in the year. Uh, at some point, we're going to flip more to thinking about, uh, about that. And if it does come down uh, too rapidly, then that will cause us to cut interest rates more aggressively. But it doesn't feel like that's really uh, what we're looking for. Uh, market priced now quite convincingly for a 25 basis point cut in, in September. Finally, 
you know, for what it's worth, getting to that cut that we were expecting right at the start of the year when we when we were in December. So it's taken a long time to, to finally get to that position. Um, and the market seems relatively relieved about it. Paul, really congratulations to you and your team for some terrific uh, reporting over the last two weeks where it's August. I know it's thin volumes, but actually there was so much going on. Do you think this lack of clarity almost from you know, the Fed or on the Fed because of this data means that we're going to be in, in a little bit of a holding pattern? Or what do you think is most interesting going forward? It feels like measures of implied volatility are coming down and that's giving uh, the market a little bit more confidence again. I think from, from an Asia perspective, uh, the Bank of Japan, uh, having gotten a little bit over hawkish, was quite chastened by the market reaction uh, to the prospect of them being more aggressive in terms of rate hikes. That seems to have cooled down in terms of expectations. So uh, maybe, maybe we won't get another hike from the BOJ until towards the end of the year or maybe even into next year. That seems to have assuaged some of those nerves around the yen carry trade after that big unwind that we saw uh, in the last week. Uh, so, um, yes, of course, everybody's going to be edgy. Everybody's going to follow the uh, policymakers very carefully, take them at their word and watching that data as well uh, and, the, and getting us through this earnings season to boot. Um, but uh, the water does seem a little bit calmer right at this moment in time. Mm. And I know, of course, on live blog, we also talk a lot about commodity prices. We talk a lot about corporate bonds. Just, you know, we all had an update on China, the Chinese economy, yeah. and in general, just Chinese assets. Yeah, that's right. I mean, from the numbers that we got out of the Chinese economy today, it seems like generally the deterioration is kind of stabilizing a little bit. But there were definitely not a lot of signs of encouragement. I think for a lot of bears, they're going to kind of look at the fact that, I mean, property investments are still slowing. I mean, retail sales beat, so that was good news. But industrial production kind of... Um, Industrial production still softened. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, for people that are kind of waiting for that property market turnaround to maybe start kind of this positive domino effect where maybe consumer demand can also strengthen, I think we didn't see any of that. Yeah. Yeah, so something that we, of course, need to keep an eye on. Thank you both for joining us. Paul Dobson and Justina Lee stays with us. We'll talk a little bit more about the UK. Now, coming up, the UK economy maintains a solid pace of recovery as services aid growth. We'll dive into the data with HSBC senior UK economist Liz Martins and Justina. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, the UK maintained a steady pace of recovery from last year's recession, with GDP rising 0.6% in the second quarter after a 0.7% gain in the first three months of the year. Now, the data was in line with economists' expectations and also reflected strength in government spending and the services sector. For more on all of this, let's bring back Justina Lee from Bloomberg and welcome Liz Martin, senior UK economist at HSBC. Liz, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, it's been a good month, actually, for the Bank of England. They managed to cut, no big waves, and a lot of the data seems to be supporting the kind of gradual pickup of the UK economy. Is that fair? It is fair. It's been a good kind of six months, I would say, actually. Yeah. Inflation started to come down. The surveys have picked up. The economy's re-accelerated a little bit. And as you say, they cut on the 1st of August. What they didn't then want to see was another big, you know, upside surprise in inflation. We didn't get that. Actually, we saw a downside surprise on services inflation. So, yeah, I think it has been a, a good few weeks for them. I mean, I guess the possi possibility that growth continues at its current pace in the second half of the year is, is maybe one of the reasons why the BOE would be quite cautious into easing too much in coming months. Is that fair? That they yeah. don't want to overheat it. I think that's right. You know, the BOE was quite interesting change of sort of strategy at the meeting. They said we're stopping focusing so narrowly on services inflation. We're going to look at the wider, more holistic picture. And of course, the stronger growth and demand is, um, the stronger inflation has the potential to be as well. So I do think it will cause them to think twice. We also had a very low unemployment number um, earlier this 
this week, which you know may or may not be a, a data anomaly. But if that is the case, that the jobs market is picking back up again, there certainly will be question marks, particularly for some members of the Monetary Policy Committee, about whether inflation is truly um, you know dissipated. Uh, and just you know, we were talking yesterday about the, you know the, the, again the strength of the economy and the fact that a lot of this rides on what we see in the budget in the autumn from the new chancellor. How's Sterling been behaving so far? Yeah, it's really been kind of also reacting to what's been going on in the U.S. So we've seen a bit of strength in the sterling and also a bit of a rise today as well. And I think partly that reflects kind of changing expectations in the U.S. in terms of the U.S. actually welcoming rate cuts. And I think it's kind of interesting going forward because in a way, the Fed and the BOE are in a relatively similar position in that they're kind of kind of like pretty hopeful about soft landing scenario right now where growth is still decent and inflation is decent but but they have to still be kind of on high alert for kind of any signs of inflation reaccelerating again but the because the economy was running pretty tight to begin with and, and so Liz, overall i guess you know the boe also suggested one of you know the key risks was again that there's this generated inflation which is stickier in the medium term are you expecting another cut this year we are expecting another cut. I mean, we're expecting a cut in November. The market's actually, I think, last time I checked, expecting two more cuts yeah. this year. Um, and that lower services inflation number that we saw earlier this week kind of plays into that. But, you know, I, I, I do think there are kind of conflicting factors. So on the one hand, yes, services inflation seems to be coming down. Uh, on the other, the economy is re-accelerating. Although the caveat to that, I will say, is consumption wasn't very strong in these numbers. Um, the growth kind of was driven more by government spending, actually. We didn't see great business investment. We didn't see great consumer spending. Um, so in the sense that, you know, it would, it would be consumer demand that might drive higher inflation, we're not seeing too much evidence of that. So, yeah, more cuts ahead. Is there an unknown on whether actually a lot of consumers, you know, dip into their savings in the second half of the year? Could that could that unlock consumer spending a yeah, bit more. Yeah, and they don't even need to dip into their savings. They just need to save a little bit less than we have been doing because actually the savings rate has been going up and up and up, which is not actually like us here in the UK. We're usually big spenders and, and borrowers, but we've been saving out of perhaps a caution and maybe now, you know, the elections passed and, and, and interest rates are coming down. Maybe we will see, um, yeah, a little bit less saving. And again, we were talking about the fact that there's always this gravitational pull from the Fed and this is a small open economy. Do we have any, when do we have the first figures on, you know, foreign direct investment or whether the, this big plan that the Chancellor put in place, whether that, that works? Yeah, and I think it's kind of interesting because, I mean, the, the new government has laid out these very aggressive growth targets that will take it kind of almost at the top of the league table at the G7. And I think, you know, they're really kind of walking a fine line here because obviously they don't want inflation to overheat. They need to worry about kind of the fiscal headroom. And there, and I think that's why they're really counting on the growth to bail them out. But I think, you know, especially if we look at, you know, the FTSE 100, which at the end of the day is a pretty kind of international index, I think a lot of that is going to kind of de depend on international demand and even Chinese demand in particular, because if we think about all the commodity names in there, and I think if you look at that part of the picture, I mean, it does seem like globally there's going to be a bit of a slowdown. It, so where does that leave, for example, is it UK assets? Is it something that looks attractive right now? I know you, you have some targets on sterling. Will it be you know, manageable for the BOE? I think so. I mean, I think, you know, actually what we've seen since the election is that the UK has been seen as a, a relative safe haven. We've had a little bit more um, eventful uh, few weeks, but generally um, the kind of policy stability should be supportive of UK assets, add in these stronger growth numbers. Um, and yeah, I think that does look somewhat positive for us. Liz, I mean, one thing that surprised me at the, at the Bank of England press conference was that the governor seemed fairly confident that maybe the geopolitical headwinds that would lead to a shock in inflation with higher oil price, that's diminished. Is, is, I mean, is there reason to believe that's the case? Well, look, geopolitics is always unpredictable, isn't it? So, um, you know, I would never be particularly confident that, 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 that geopolitical risks have dissipated. What I would say is, you know, oil prices haven't really been the centre of that. It's shipping costs that we're really worried about. You know, they've really increased... Um, and that may be starting to feed through to higher goods price inflation. You know, we saw that actually in the inflation numbers earlier this week. Services down a bit, core goods up a bit. So it's a bit like whack-a-mole. You know, you get one bit under control and the other bit pops back up again. So that's the bit I think I'd be worried about. Yeah, how, and we, we talk about the, the price of oil, but actually, again, it just feels very range-bound, given everything we've seen. 
Yeah, it's kind of interesting because if you think about the fact that there are growing geopolitical tensions between Israel and Iran, and of course all the news out of the Middle East this year, I mean, this outcome would seem pretty surprising in terms of oil. And I think, you know, we are seeing kind of oil kind of rise a little bit because of those tensions. But I think on the other hand, they've kind of been offset by some supply side factors, as well as kind of the, the sluggish demand, you know, in terms of global growth. Thank you both for joining us. Liz Martins there from HSBC and Bloomberg's Justina Lee. Now, coming up, a global health emergency. The WHO sounds the alarm on the MPOX outbreak in Africa. We have all of the details next, and this is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now, the World Health Organization has declared an MPOX outbreak in Africa a global health emergency. Now, a mutated strain of the virus has infected about 15,000 people in at least six African countries and killed more than 500 in the Democratic Republic of Congo. WHO has been working on the MPOX outbreak in Africa and raising the alarm that this is something that should concern us all. The emergency committee met and advised me that, in its view, the situation constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. Well, let's get straight to Sam Fazeli, senior pharmaceutical analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, uh, Sam, I saw the headline yesterday, and of course I was looking forward to, to trying to understand, a, a, exactly what this means and how serious this becomes. Why are we so worried now? Yeah, so I'd, um, Francine, I would add um, a couple of elements here, which is why I think they've decided to go this way. First, the speed with which it spread. The, you know, they, they had a uh, public health emergency uh, pronunci uh, pronouncement for the last one, which was about two years ago. They, they rescinded that about 15 months ago, and now we're back again. But why? Because, first, it's not the same strain of the virus. This is what's called clade one as opposed to clade two. Last year was clade two. Clade one is supposed to be, although I'm not quite sure data truly solidly backs that, more lethal. This is clade one. And clade one previously didn't use to transmit sexually. Uh, it needed just um, a, bo bo a body contact with the postules. This seems to be transmitting um, sexually because it's mutated a little bit. It's lost a piece of its genome. And hence it's called clade one B. That's what I think the WHO is worried about, especially because you get a one or two week incubation period where you don't know you're infectious. And so through that kind of activity, you pass the virus on, which is where we've ended up so far in 2024 with more cases than we had in 2023. And we're only halfway through the year, roughly. So, so what, are, what are the risks globally, basically, that, it's, that it even increases in the spread? Yeah, clade 2 also transmitted sexually. It's just clade 1 that never did and now is mutated, so it can. I, so the sp speed with which it will um, uh, spread, it all depends on, on obviously human activity and um, vaccination is useful. Vaccination doesn't necessarily, we, but there's no way we can get as ma uh, the vaccines out that fast. Mm -hmm. um, but th the good thing about it is that it's not respiratory. <clears throat> so you don't transmit it by you and I talking here, which if it was a respiratory virus, we, you would have a risk of catching it from me or vice versa. Yeah. Here you need, you need bodily contact and, or, or se uh, sexual activity. So. so what does it mean? Again, if you call an emergency or if there's an emergency declaration, what happens next? Does it well, activate levers? Yeah, it, it brings everybody together. So the WHO is, is now looking at putting in more testing capabilities within the countries. And I think one of the key things that it does is that it increases public awareness. I mean, you know, we've been reading about these things. In April, this, this clade 1B was published. The not, cases were going up. Um, but now everybody talks about it. So I think there's a major element of that. Thank you so much, Sam Fazeli. There, of course, with the very latest on MPOX. He is uh, one of our experts on the story, so I know we'll speak to Sam, well, probably every day. Coming up, easing U.S. inflation ramps up expectations of a September rate cut. We'll discuss the impact of the data on the FX markets. That's next, and this is Bloomberg.
European stocks gain as investors cheer a string of encouraging economic data from the world's three biggest economies. The UK maintained a steady pace of recovery from last year's recession, putting the Prime Minister, Keir Starmer, on a strong economic footing as he looks to boost growth and repair the public finances. Plus, international mediators of Gaza ceasefire talks are set to meet with Israeli negotiators on Thursday. It comes as Tel Aviv and its allies brace for a retaliatory attack from Iran over the killing of a senior Hamas leader. Now back to macro news and underlying U.S. inflation eased for a fourth month on an annual basis in July, keeping the Fed on track to cut interest rates next month. Now the data also showed year-on-year -year core consumer prices rose at the slowest pace since 2021. So what impact has this had on the dollar and of course on other currencies? Sam Linton Brown, global head of macro strategy at BNP Paribas, now joins us. Thank you so much, uh, Sam, for, for being with us. I mean, it's been a crazy two weeks and I think if you speak to a lot of traders, they want to get the dollar trade right because that means getting Fed cuts right, and that kind of uh, means that they're reading the U.S. economy right. What's the market not understanding about the economy in America right now? Our view is that the market's a bit over its skis and its expectation that the rebalancing in the labor market, the slowdown in the economy that we're seeing, is going to quickly transition into a recession. So we think the market's priced in a little bit too much for the Fed in the near term, and we'd expect that the data flow over the next few weeks, as well as some of the central bank language, might rebalance that a little bit. That could start this afternoon. Yeah. We have initial claims. We have retail sales. We think the initial claims data, jobless claims, is going to be especially important here. What we saw last week is that Texas and Michigan, two states that have been heavily affected by the hurricane in the U.S., um, showed some improvement in the data. We expect a similar observation today. If that's the case, it might begin to give the market some confidence that the weakness that we saw in U.S. data over the past month is in large part, or is at least um, to some extent, having been impacted by the weather. And therefore, it's, it's less likely to be sustained. If that's right, while the inflation data allows the Fed to begin cutting in September, we think those cuts are probably going to be a bit slower and to a shallower magnitude than the market expects. But so you think this would be a mistake because if they're seeing a recession, they could have a started cutting already. And does it mean that they'll be more aggressive in the cutting? If a recession were to come, the Fed needs to take policy rates below neutral, which given that we're well above neutral implies pretty considerable rate cuts and more than we're currently pricing in. But we'd argue on the basis of the information we have right now to assume we're heading into recession is, is a bit premature. Where's neutral? Because it's, it's one of the, I mean, between R star and neutral, this is like... If one looks at some of the more economist-derived estimates, there's a very popular one called HLW, and you adjust for surveys of inflation expectations, it would put it at about 3% in nominal terms, not too far from the Fed's long-run dot. The market perceives that level to be a bit higher, around 3.5%. Um, Sam, talk to me a little bit about the U.S. elections. Again, we have two very different candidates with two very different economic policy, especially on, you know, a weaker dollar or higher tariffs. Mm. It, wh when does the market start actually pricing in the outcomes properly in, in currencies? I think the market already, to some extent, has began to hedge against different U.S. election outcomes, but it does that less in underlying prices and in spot prices. It does it more through options. So that's happened, and there's quite a high FX volatility implied premium over the election already. The market's expecting the biggest moves to happen in dollar CNH, dollar MEX, and to a lesser extent, um, euro dollar. I think for, for spot prices, we'll begin to price it in as we get much nearer to the election. So, so not yet or if the probability skews more significantly in a different direction. I think the main conclusion for the market is that if we're to price a higher chance of a Republican sweep, in turn price a higher probability that there's going to be significant increases in tariffs, that's bullish for the dollar. But so, again, where does it, what's the best way to play it? Is it currencies or do you also look at, uh, you know, could you go just for an index, so equities or commodities? I think the currency angle skews strong dollar in a Republican sweep and that same backdrop of a Republican sweep potentially leading to looser fiscal and higher tariffs also skews towards a steeper um, U.S. interest rate curve. Um, Sam, talk to me about some of the other basic, I mean, I, I wanted to ask you about sterling, we talk about euro, we talk about yen, so what's the most interesting pairing to, to dollar away from the Canadian dollar? Yeah, there's, there's a lot going on. Um, there is a lot going on. There is a lot on. going on. Um, it's probably the understatement of the year. Of the currencies you mentioned, I think the yen. 
that's what's been majorly in focus, a large contributing factor to the correction we saw in global markets as the move down in Dolly and permeated into Nikkei, permeated into S&P, permeated into, into VIX. Our view is that Dolly in at these levels is actually due to recover a little bit. It will retest the 150 level, we think. It's undershot where we see fair value derived from relative interest rate markets. At the same time against that, we think that yields in Japan have actually fallen too much, though. They've corrected too far down, and that if we're right on the Bank of Japan and they continue to hike interest rates gradually, not to super high levels, but certainly higher than the market's pricing it, it implies paying rates in Japan as well. Sam, I mean, the market believes that you know, whoever the next prime minister is will probably have a bigger sway on the policies and therefore on yen. Mm -hmm. or, is that correct? The way I'd frame it is the political backdrop in Japan over the past decade has been very conducive to looser fiscal, easier monetary. Yep. And the factions that were most associated with those policies, Abe's faction, um, seems to be a bit less influential at the moment. And so that means that going forward, it's consistent with a gradual tightening in monetary policy in Japan, again, consistent with, with paying rates in Japan. The feedback to, to dollar yen, at some point, it could begin to push dollar yen lower as Japanese rates start to rise. I'd argue that at this stage, dollar yen will be far more sensitive to the U.S. cyclical backdrop because the scope for U.S. yields to rise or fall compared to Japan is just so much greater. Um, what happens to euro? Again, they're kind of, you know, Europe in general is stuck in the middle between the U.S. and China. They're trying to do policies, maybe not to uh, be completely in the way, but it's going to be very difficult for this region to really kick off with implications on currencies. I think the first observation I'd make on, on the euro and euro dollar in particular is it's it's held up very well, despite there having been a growth scare. Typically, as the market becomes more pessimistic on growth, you see Eurodollar head down. That hasn't happened. And we think there's actually some informational value there, rather than it just being about positioning, such that the euro will, on a sustainable basis, prove more resilient to global growth shocks. Its global beta, its equity beta, has, has really come down. I think going forward, um, if we're right on the U.S. side of things, that the market's a bit over its skis in the pricing of the slowdown and the pricing of Fed cuts, then we could see euro dollar retrace a little bit of its, its gains recently, heading back to that 108.50 level. Hey, will the European Central Bank be very tentative in doing more cuts? We expect them to continue to, to cut at a quarterly pace of 25 bips, so two, two more cuts this year. Okay. Um, in September and then, then again in, in December, continuing that quarterly cutting pace until they get policy rates to around 250 to, to 275 in, in deposit rates. The recovery in Europe, though, it should be noted, has performed relatively in, in line with what we and I think the market then eventually started to expect. Growth's back at trend. Mm -hmm. It's a bit weaker in Germany, but it's very strong in the periphery, in particular Spain. And so the recovery in Europe is, is in play. Uh, the BOE, I mean, the UK actually economy is, is in better shape, frankly, than we thought. H1's been good. H1's been good. And the, the recent um, labour market data as well on, on the employment side was, was, was OK. We still think the Bank of England will cut in September, though. We think they're, they're in the process of normalising policy and that the inflation data, the, the wages data they got in the employment report is going to be um, conducive to that for the pound. I'd very much echo the comments that your previous guest, Elizabeth, made. Um, UK assets are cheap. Pounds cheap. We're in a period where the political backdrop should be conducive over time yep. to some more investment into the UK. And while the Bank of England's cutting rates, it's cutting rates from a very high level, and it's probably going to leave rates at still quite a high level compared to history. So we think the backdrop for the pound in the medium term is bullish. Sam, thank you so much for all of the great insight into a lot of currencies. Sam Linton Brown, Global Head of Macro Strategy at BNP Paribas, joining us this morning. Now, coming up, we talk geopolitics. Mediators hope a new round of Gaza truce talks can ease tensions in the Middle East. But with Hamas representatives not due to attend, what are the prospects for a deal? We'll get the latest next, and this is Bloomberg. Conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is The Pulse, and I'm Francis Lacqua here in London. Now, mediators from the U.S., Qatar, and Egypt are set to meet with Israeli negotiators in Doha today in a fresh attempt at striking a Gaza ceasefire deal. For more, let's bring in Ross Matheson, Bloomberg's EMEA News Director and Mark Champion from Bloomberg Opinion. Um, Ross, when you look at the escalating conflict right, between Israel and Iran, I mean, we're talking almost you know, daily about 
the possibility of an escalation and an all-out war between them. Where are we today? Well, we're still waiting to see what, if any, retaliation Iran does. As you say, it's been two weeks and every day since uh, the killing of a senior Hamas official in Tehran, which, of course, Iran has blamed on Israel and Israel has not claimed responsibility for. Iran's been saying, we're going to have to retaliate. We have to do something. This happened on our own soil. Um, but they've also been framing that, that very much in the language of trying to do something within the bounds of international law, whatever that means, and clearly not wanting this to tip either into a full-blown Mideast conflict. So the question is, what kind of retaliation are they still looking at and when might it come and why have they not done it so far? So multiple questions to look at. I mean, one reason they may not have done it so far is they're still trying to work out what exactly the calibrated response might be. They may want to see how these ceasefire talks go that are happening today in Doha. But also, you know, they've got Israel on edge for two weeks now. I mean, they're in a state of high alert in Israel preparing. You know, they've got bunkers, they've got their flashlights, they've got their transistor radios. You know, and, and that in a set itself might be a positive for Iran. They can see the way that, you know, they're keeping Israel in a, in a heightened state of concern. Mark, again, when you look at the retaliatory action that, you know, intelligence points to that we've been waiting for quite some time, is it linked to the ceasefire talks? Uh, well, so we don't know, but I think Rose is exactly right that uh, there actually is a, a great deal for Iran to gain by waiting. They control the agenda. Everyone's running around in circles. Um, and, uh, you know, if they wait until after the ceasefire talks, uh, it's, it's all upside for them. So, you know, if they go the right way, uh, then they may be able to sort of, you know, parlay that into uh, something, you know, that, that works for them. Um, if, if there's a, a failure uh, and then the Iranians strike, they can say, look, this, you know, this was about uh, a Palestinian leader being hit in Tehran. This is about, you know, people in Gaza. It's about the Palestinians. And, you know, we're on the right side of history and have the moral high ground and all this kind of stuff. So, I, you know, to me, uh, you know, we'll see there are two separate issues here. One is, you know, tactical. How do you calibrate so you don't end up with a wider war, but you make a signal? And the other is political. But what does Iran actually want? You, you know, wrote a, a, a very well thought out explainer, also understanding how or explaining how Iran has extended its powers through some of the allied militant groups. What's Iran's end game here in the Middle East? Well, the end game is to get the United States out of the Middle East and to, uh, you know, establish Iran as the uh, regional superpower. Uh, so that's the end game. We're a long, long, long way for that. And Israel is very much, you know, a part of that strategy for them. Uh, and, uh, you know, Israel is the very well armed, uh, tight ally of the United States in the Middle East. Um, so, you know, all of this, you know, if you remember also, you know, when uh, the war in Gaza began with the strike by Hamas, this was at a moment when Saudi Arabia was very close to a security deal with the U.S. that was triangulated with Israel, um, a great threat to Iran. Uh, so, you know, I think you, you always have to see it in the, in the sort of larger picture. Um, the problem is, you know, uh, that, you know, people may, you know, the Iranians, the Israelis, the Americans may all, you know, want to think in that sort of larger picture, but events on the ground always, always yeah. uh, push you in directions that may not work for, you know, for your larger strategy. Uh, and Ross, why is a ceasefire in Gaza so difficult to achieve? And is it actually something that Iran would support? Well, it's very difficult to see how two parties who are at war can come together, you know, to begin with, to get a truce, let alone a lasting truce. And we've got significant sticking points on either side. So you're starting from a position of not much goodwill. You've got the difficulty of how do you negotiate when you can't sit in a room together and negotiate. So you've got intermediaries negotiating for you, passing messages back and forth. That makes it very delicate and complex. And you have fundamental disagreement about what is the end game for a ceasefire. Is the ceasefire a pathway to a permanent end to the conflict? That's what Hamas wants. Uh, is it just a pause and then you have the right to resume fighting, which is what Israel wants, because their ultimate goal is to, is to eradicate Hamas. That's what they say their goal is. And so those things are in fundamental conflict. So getting the understanding of what the ceasefire is for is difficult. Then you've got sticking points around certain arrangements around hostages, Israel hostages that remain in Gaza. You've got sticking points about where Israeli troops go. Do they pull back to certain places? You've also got sticking points about how do you get uh, civilians in Gaza back to the north? 
Israel's concern that Hamas would go alongside those civilians. And so multiple problems there. And again, you've got, you know, Qatar, Egypt, the US negotiating really on behalf of others, in a, in a sense, and a lot of bad will there. So will we see anything tangible come from these talks? It's very hard to see that. Mark, it was only last week that I think Iran's president told Emmanuel Macron of France that they must urge Israel to accept a truce in Gaza. I mean, d does he really want a truce? And what, what does truce look like, to Raz's point? I think the Iranians would like to see a truce, uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, at this point, for them, uh, that works. And, you know, they would be able to, uh, you know, move on. I mean, the, the thing to understand at this point in Gaza is that, you know, even the Israeli security forces believe that they've more or less achieved what they can for now militarily. Um, so, you know, there have been a number of leaks of Security Council meetings of, uh, you know, disputes between them and Netanyahu. Uh, you know, who wants, you know, uh, a, a stronger deal. Um, he called his security chiefs weak negotiators, according to these leaks. Um, so, you know, it, it's, you know, even on the Israeli side, there's a lot of division over, you know, what, whether it's worth uh, pursuing further. Um, for the Iranians, I think they'd also like to see things calm down and to be able to claim it as a victory. I mean, would Benjamin Netanyahu ever back down and, and sign a truce? And actually, who's the right person to get him to the table? Very, very tough question. I mean, so far, there's very little sign that he does want one uh, and quite a lot of evidence that he uh, is resisting. Uh, so, you know, what might change that is, um, you know, it's, it, that's a tough one. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's resisting also because it gives him political will back home. Well, that's right, because there's been lots of questions. I mean, and before this war happened, of course, he was under a lot of pressure at home. Remember, there were big protests that were going on over his leadership, his administration, lots of questions about himself personally and his record, um, which we know. And so those all died down at home, obviously, in the aftermath of the Hamas attack on Israel. But he was a prime minister under significant pressure in a very kind of unwieldy administration. And obviously this war has staved that off. It's given him a boost. We're not say, suggesting he wants the war to prolong purely because of that, but it does you know, give him that political cover at the moment. Um, and it's, it has led to a bit of a boost in his popularity at home. Even if people don't like him particularly as a leader, you know, they're, they're obviously endorsing the actions of Israel in Gaza. So so Israelis support the war by and large, and, and so that's helped him out. But obviously, if the war ends, all those questions come back to the fore, including how did this attack on Israel on October 7th happen to begin with? All right. Thank you both for joining us. Ros Matheson, Bloomberg NEA News Director and Mark Champion from Bloomberg Opinion. Now, coming up, U.S. futures edge higher as traders take on board the latest U.S. inflation data. We'll be looking at what that means for the Fed next. This is Bloomberg. week. Balance of Power is live in Chicago for the Democratic National Convention. So we've got a race here and the sprint begins. We'll bring you breaking developments. Vice President Kamala Harris closing the gap with Donald Trump. And informative analysis all leading up to special coverage Thursday evening, including Vice President Harris's acceptance speech as the Democratic nominee for president. As president, I will show Donald Trump what real leadership looks like. Tune in all next week on Bloomberg Television. U.S. future is higher as traders look ahead to more economic data that could reinforce the case for the Fed to start cutting rates next month. Now, let's bring in Vent Ram from Bloomberg and Live. Vent, so good to speak to you. So what's the immediate outlook for Treasuries after yesterday's CPI report? Morning, Francine. Good to be talking to you. I mean, the inflation data that we got yesterday was kind of incremental in that it showed continued progress on the disinflationary narrative. We got a 2.9% reading, as you know, slower than what the markets were kind of expecting. Now, that is consistent with the Fed's PCE, core PCE, that has already been trending towards 2.6%, the target for this year. So the Fed kind of is, gets confirmatory evidence that, look, 
Inflation is slowly converging to the target, even if it's some miles away from it yet. But, you know, the Fed is therefore keen to cut its uh, benchmark rate, which is at 5375 now. So the real policy rate, the Fed's real policy rate adjusted for inflation is more than 270 basis points. So the Fed's thinking is that it doesn't need to be as restrictive at current levels. So they are keen to cut rates, but the markets seem to be getting the impression that they are desperate to cut rates, which is the wrong takeaway from the inflation data. The Fed is keen to cut rates, yeah, but not desperate to cut rates, means that you know, the markets are pricing 100 basis points of rate cuts in the remainder of the year. I think that's a folly. So I think that Treasuries have to correct higher from here, which means that the two-year will go higher than 4%, Francine. I love it when you say, I think it's a folly. Um, what, what does today's GDP report in the UK mean for the Bank of England, Van? Well, I think that, you know, the GDP shows that uh, what we have believed all along and that the UK economy is much more resilient than many expect in the markets. But, you know, yesterday's inflation data out of the UK was interesting in the sense that it showed inflation was slower than what many people had penciled in, including the BOE. So as you know, you know, earlier this month, the Bank of England cut rates and there were four who voted for the Bank of England to stay put with rates. So, and those dissenters may kind of have a change of heart and think maybe inflation is getting really going slower. We also saw a slowdown in services and core inflation. So I think that increasingly it looks like we may get two rate cuts from the Bank of England this year if everything works out, mm -hmm. uh, works out well according to the forecasts. Ven, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. Ven Ram from Bloomberg M Live. Up next, Bloomberg Brief with Manus Cranny. That's from New York, and this is Bloomberg.